When it comes to reducing the spread of COVID-19, we all have a role to play. By staying vigilant and following a few important tips, we'll stay safe together. Proper hand hygiene and not touching your face are critical. Wash your hands often with soap and water, especially after you've been in a public place. If soap and water are not available, use a hand sanitizer. Another critical but simple safety guideline is social distancing. Set an example by not gathering in groups or in crowded places and keep a minimum of six feet away from others when in public. You should also stay vigilant by cleaning and disinfecting your home regularly especially frequently touched surfaces. For example, objects like doorknobs, light switches, and faucets, or surfaces like countertops, tables, and desks, and even technology like your phone, keyboards, and remote controls. Remember that following these universal guidelines and reminding your friends and families to do the same will lessen the impact and spread of COVID-19.
Oh, what a beautiful, beautiful day it is. Hallelujah. And welcome back to the house of our God. Amen. Somebody shout, say something like you're happy to be here. As Pastor always says, I was glad when they said unto me, come, let us go into the house of the Lord. And it's so wonderful to see all of you here in the sanctuary and those we know who are at home or on, on your online somehow watching and participating. As we get our service started, we ask that you just make your place a sacred place. And just focus your hearts and minds now because we enter into the presence of our God and give him all glory and all praise. To lead us in our praise, to lead us in our worship, to lead us in our adoration to the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, please welcome our very own Brother Phil Glover. It's okay to clap, yes. bold in worship, bold in our colors today because it is Pentecost Sunday. It is that day when we commemorate the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, not only upon us, but within us, filling us to the overflowing until we even speak in tongues unfamiliar to us and yet still are understood, where we are emboldened for service for the Lord and able to do beyond our own physical and mental abilities because we have supernatural help. Can somebody say amen? amen? Yes. So today we rejoice. You know, only Holy Spirit can wear red so well. And so let us, if you would stand with me for our call to worship today, that will just add on to what Brother Phil has just done. Testify to the goodness of God. Sing praise to God. Testify to the love of Christ. Sing praise to Christ. Testify to the presence of the Holy Spirit. Sing praise to the Spirit. Let us pray. Wind of God, 
present since before creation, fall upon us. Whisper to us, shout to us, comfort and guide us, align us and you, and revive our own spirit to love and serve. And as we say amen, would you put your hands together and could we give just the Holy Spirit a clap offering. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. And now listen, I want to warn you, um, my background is, as most of you know, is Pentecostal, so I always love my amen corner. All right, so just know it's going to come out one way or the other, okay? Amen. You may be seated as we welcome Sister Jennifer Trusted to come and sing, There's a Sweet, Sweet Spirit, one of my favorites. And she's accompanied by, of course, our brother Phil Glover. a sweet, sweet spirit in this place, and I know that it's the spirit of the Lord. There are sweet expressions on each face, and I know they feel the presence of the Lord. Sweet Holy Spirit, sweet heavenly dove, stay right here with us, filling us with your love. And for these blessings, we lift our hearts in praise. Without a doubt, we'll know that we have been revived when we shall leave this place. There are blessings you cannot receive. Hallelujah. That's just such a wonderful sound, Sister Tristan. God bless you. 
Wonderful rendition. Wonderful. To God be the glory. What a day. Today is Pentecost Sunday, and you can feel a fire in here. We're jazzing things up in the Westbury UMC, and we just give God thanks and praise for the wonderful ministry of all our talented and gifted ministers among us. We thank God this morning. Amen. Bless the name of the Lord. So we just want you to get ready to mark your calendars. We are excited. There is a lot of announcements. I'm going to go through them rather quickly so we can get to the good stuff. But we do have some important church matters and announcements that we want you to take note of. Do keep in mind that the church office is open. It is now open from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. We always want to remind you of that so you know it is not 10 to 3. Please, any announcements, any prayer requests, anything that you need to get into the office, please make sure that you are doing so within the hours of 9 a.m. and 1 p.m. That's when our, our, our church admin, Nina, will be in the office. Please also remember that we do pray. A church without prayer is a very weak church, and I want y'all to know that we are a very strong church. We are strong in spirit, we are strong in faith, and we are believing God for big things. So we want to make sure that we are praying Monday, Wednesdays, and Friday mornings at 6 a.m. The prayer line number is right before you. We know that we want you to set that alarm. Make this year extra special by waking up and joining the company of believers. On Wednesday morning, we do begin to introduce um, well, actually, Sunday mornings is adult Bible study. So Sunday mornings at 7, at 8.30 a.m., we do have our adult Bible study. And we're putting that up there because we want you to dial in. And there is an access code. That is, being, that is happening every Sunday morning at 8.30 a.m. That is our adult Bible study. So the number is on the screen for you. The passcode is on the screen. Do join in. I do believe that is being led by our brother Ed Hale. And it, the discussions are amazing. He usually has a, a very well-formatted way that, that the adults learn and study the Bible. 8.30 a.m. in the morning. And on Wednesday evening, now we do have Theo Talk, and Theo Talk is, is just uh, another way of engaging the Bible and engaging Scripture. We do that through theological discussions every Wednesday at 7 p.m. with our pastor. That is on Zoom. It is continuing to be on Zoom for now, and we just want you to join in. It's from 7 to 9. We engage real topics, real relevant issues that are uh, affecting us right now, and we learn what does the Bible say about that? How relevant is it that we are going through what we're going through today, and, and how, what does the Word of God have to say about that to help us in these times? We want you to be reminded that our dear sister Iona Monroe, um, she has transitioned to be with the Lord. The wake and the viewing will be from 9 to 1025 this Friday, May 28th at the church. The service will be from 1030 a.m. to 1130 a.m. The information is on the screen, so please, the internet, um, the internment will be at the Plain Lawn Cemetery at uh 279 West Old Country Road, and that's in Hicksville. So please um, do, if you want to pay your respects and support the family, they will be here on Friday at 1030 a.m. So we, we will be in agreement with that for, and in prayers, continued prayers for the family, for, the, for Sister uh, Monroe's family. Amen? Boy Scouts are continuing to ask us to look out and to engage young troopers that are ready, willing, and able. They are looking for Scout Masters to help. Please contact our brother Cox, Scout Master Cox, and also Scout Master Alex Nunez. They are looking for Scout leaders as well as for the young men between the ages of 11 and 18 to participate. We've been making those announcements steadily, so we do believe that it is in your hearing, and if you know of anyone, that you will forward them to the right people. Today, 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 Pentecost Sunday, on Zoom conference, the Westbury Clergy Fellowship Pentecost Sunday celebration will be held today at 4 p.m. So we do want you to join if you are available. It is Zoom, and the Reverend uh, Bishop Lionel Harvey will be the guest speaker, I want to say. So it is today at 4 p.m., and the Zoom information is on the screen or maybe you can call in, but I believe all the dial-in information is on the screen if you are able to get into it today. There is a link to click into, but 
you can always call. Oh, there was an email sent yesterday. So Pastor just reminded us that there is also an email that was sent with the link for you to join today at four. That's the Westbury Clergy Fellowship. As you have continued to give into the house of the Lord, there is special offerings and um, we have been doing this initiative uh, for about a week now. Uh, the special offering is requesting for flood victims in the Gambia. And uh, Pastor and I, most of you will know and you will hear later on, we had a wonderful, wonderful visit to Africa via the Gambia. Uh, there are special tithes and offerings that are being collected. So we want you to continue if there's anyone that are giving into that. There is an online giving platform also, but you will hear more about that in a little bit. And with all those announcements in mind, I know we were celebrating some birthdays here in the month of May, and I wasn't here on the first, but I know a good bit of our folks had birthdays in the month of May, and um, I just wanted to just say happy birthday to them again. A few of them that are among us, I know our pastor had his birthday on the first. I know Brother Phil, Sister Rose, I know... Um, Marjorie Moon, I know uh, Kathy Ward two days ago, and for all of our May people, we just celebrate you this month and give God thanks for you as he continues to sustain you and keep you in the faith, amen? And Miss Berry, obviously Miss Berry, who could forget? All the wonderful, outgoing, oh, the, not the best people, Pastor, but wonderful, <laughs> wonderful people. <laughs> And Ms. Ralston, and Phil agrees, all the best people. All right, Lord, we will take that today. We celebrate the birthdays anyway, so we can give them a happy birthday, hand clap. And for all the other folks that are coming up towards the end of the month, we celebrate you and your birthday. To God be the glory. Get your hearts and your mind prepared as our sister Jennifer is coming right back up to continue to bless our hearts and our mind with the spirit song today. It is Pentecost Sunday, so we are rejoicing today. You will hear all about the Spirit of the Lord today. Amen? Let us settle our hearts. Jesus, oh 
Spirit here today. Just the sweet move of the Spirit. Hallelujah. And you're refreshing. Hallelujah. Just the refreshing Spirit. Yes. 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 Amen. Amen. Praise the name of the Lord. Praise God. Come, sweet Spirit, and fill our lands, fill our hearts. Fill everything about us. Don't leave any empty spaces. Come, sweet spirit. Praise the name of Jesus. I stand here to lead us in prayer for our brothers and sisters and for ourselves. And oh, the spirit of God is here to bear our prayers upon wings. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. We've had added to our, you see the names on the screens, and added to them is the family of Garland, Henry, and the Bell family today. There's many who are grieving, who are going through illness, who have had situations within their family. And one person just said, I just need to forgive. I need what I need to forgive. And we know that sometimes forgiving when we're deeply hurt is so difficult. But yet, God tells us to forgive. And so this morning, we ask the Lord for help. I was up in the mountains of Haiti, in Port Jacques in Haiti, when after preaching, the minister up there gave a blessing. And he particularly directed that blessing to me. And verse two, I'm going to read verse 2 of that blessing. It is from Psalm chapter 20. I keep it very close to me. Psalm chapter 20. He says, may God send you help from the sanctuary. And the King James Version says, and strengthen you out of Zion. Oh, can I say that again? Yeah. May God send you help from the sanctuary and strengthen you or support you out of Zion. I visualize that, you know, we watch movies and we see somebody held up by the enemy. And, this, that, you know, it seemed to be only them and the enemy is wearing them down and they've somehow sent for help, whether it's pigeon by pigeon or smoke signal or one person escaped, but somehow they sent for help. And just in the nick of time before their barricades, before their defenses got breached, you heard the sound of the trumpet. You heard the sound of the tubal. Help is here. And the enemy is pushed back and overcome and they are delivered. So this morning, may God send you help from the sanctuary. And I know it's not my time to preach, but this has gotten deep under my skin. When you come into the presence of the Lord, when you come into the sanctuary, it is not just a formality. It is to lay a foundation and to stake your claim that in the time of trouble, you can say, God, send me help. from the sanctuary and strengthen me from Zion, this place. Strengthen me, support me from this place. And so God, our prayer is just that today, that in all our calamities, in all the wars we fight on so many sides, in all our tribulations, in all our frustrations and misunderstandings and misgivings, and all the things that we feel that tie us up on the inside and weigh upon us so heavenly, heavenly, dear God Almighty, send us help. And we are so willing with open arms to receive the help you send us. Thank you, Holy Father. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. 
Hallelujah. Somebody bless the Lord up in this house. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the help. Oh, because you have not abandoned us. You have not left us to the beggarly elements. But even the angels come to bear us up lest we should dash our foot against the stone. I don't know about you, but I have a sense of invincibility. Not because I'm arrogant or foolish, but because I know the help comes from Zion. Ah, when I need it. Amen. Oh, yes, sister. Somebody's testifying back there. Amen oh, and amen oh, and amen. Oh, We're going to have our word and response, and immediately afterwards, we are going to be again mm, transported into that place where the Spirit of God touches earth. And we are gifted again once more with a sense of Pentecost. Is that all right? Is that all right? Listen, when you come into the house of the Lord, whatever is going on, you've got to have a little bit of excitement up in here. Because this is where your help comes from. <laughs> My help! Oh, oh, pastor is preaching today. Hallelujah. Amen. <laughs> yes, Lord. Hallelujah. Stand again with me and join with me in our word and response. Hallelujah. For those of you who are, think, are still hesitant to come to the house of the Lord, come. There is enough room. Come. It's amazing. The more of us that are here, the greater the ignition of spirit. I mean, even, even the sense of our maestro, Brother Phil's fingers, tips on the organ and thing just seems to be lighter. Yes. Hallelujah. Come. Amen. We'll be reading from Psalm 104, verses 24 through 34. Hallelujah, from the New King James Version. O oh Lord, how manifold are your works. I already hear the sermon. I'm sorry, I already hear it. Yes, <laughs> forgive me. Let me behave myself in the house of the Lord today. O oh Lord, how manifold are your works. In wisdom you have made them all. The earth is full of of your possessions it's in wide sea mm. in which are innumerable teeming things living these both small and great there are ships about to sail there is that Leviathan which you have made to play there these all wait for you you must you that you may give them their food in due season. What you give them, they gather in. You open your hand, they are filled with good. You hide your face, they are troubled. You take away their breath, they die and return to their dust. You send forth your spirit, they are created, and you renew the face of the earth. May the glory of the Lord endure forever. May the Lord rejoice in his works. He looks on the earth and it trembles. He touches the hills and they smoke. I will sing of the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praise Hallelujah. to my God while I have my being. May my meditations be sweet to him. I will be glad in the Lord. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Is, yes, put yes. your hands together as we receive the dance ministry of a Westbury UMC. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. This is Tasha Cobb singing Fill Me Up Overflow on one mic, one take.
Ooh, do you feel that strength of the sweet spirit in the house today? Certainly the Lord has visited us. Amen. Thank you so much, dance ministry. Thank you so much, Sister Trusted. Thank you so much, Brother Phil, yeah. for leading us to this point where we would ask to be filled to the overflowing. And I know it's the overflowing that empowers us so much to do all that God has asked of us and that which our hearts desire. Let us be filled today to the overflowing. And to breathe on us the word from the written word to the spoken word, would you please receive the angel of this house, our own beloved pastor. I know he is filled up himself and he just needs to empty out a little bit. He went to the motherland and got some extras. And he has come back with that eagerness and earnest just to connect with us. So please, warmly welcome our pastor, the Reverend Dr. Elon Sylvester. Yes. Well, praise the name of the Lord. Pastor Sonia, you always introduce me so nice. Sometimes I wonder who you're talking about. <laughs> I'm like, who, me? Praise the Lord. Well, we thank God today. And today, I'm not going to preach a sermon per, per se, but what we're going to try to do is to give you a little bit of a reflection of our little trip to Gambia, some of the things that we've learned, and some of the things that has weighed heavily on our spirit, and I believe it would weigh on your spirit also. Um, so Tani will be helping me today. And I know when Pastor Sonia saw the uh, word and response, she got all excited. Because something the Lord said to her in that, and she said, oh, I see what the sermon is going to be today. <laughs> well, unfortunately, this is one of those days when the uh, word of response doesn't directly connect to what we're going to be speaking about. So maybe the Lord is putting a message in your heart to bring to us. <laughs> Amen? Amen. <laughs> Praise the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. So, Tani, would you join me? As we talk about this, and I hope that our systems will cooperate, and Sage has given me the thumbs up. We couldn't get it from here, but he, of course, you know, we gotta, we got to thank God for the people that we have in this house. Sometimes, sometimes my heart is so full, because in this house, oh God, God's put good people here, good people. People who work sacrificially, people who work behind the scenes, you all don't even know. You know, this, this, this Thursday, or was it Friday, I came in and I saw the guy brought a truckload of food for the pantry. Five skids of food. And if I wasn't here, guess who would have had to take that five skids of food, included one skid fill of bags of rice, like 60 pounds bags of rice, guess who would have had to bring all of that in? Just Sister Naz and Sister Antoinette. And just before that, Beaumont had come in with his truck and his car load full with food and they just offloaded it into the pantry. And just as he left, he pulls up that city out, that Long Island Harvest truck with all five skids of food. So thank God I was there to be able to lend a hand. What do you think about that sacrifice? When you look at Sister Angela, comes in here two days a week and spend usually almost the entire day going over the finances of this church, keeping us all on the street and narrow, inventing ways to make ends meet. <laughs> And she does that every single week. Hmm? And listen, I could go about talking. You see Sister Marshall there, all is quiet, and acting like she don't know nothing? Good. Prayer warrior. 
everything she supports, both financially, good, and she finds every way to make sure that our evangelism team is connecting, reaching out to the people. When she thinks that we're not reaching out, you know, she calls me, Pastor, we have to do this, and we have to do that. I'm like, okay, all right. Yes, okay, let's make it happen. And I, I can go on and on here about the people who make sacrifices. Look, Sister Tristan right there. Usually the only white person in the congregation as today. And yet still she feels like, she doesn't feel like if she, 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 oh my God, how do you describe that? We have good people here. People who God has touched and placed in this house. Brother Phil, not only with the skill huh, of, of skilled musician. But every week he makes sure that we, our music ministry is together. And he comes in and he practices not only for his own performance, but also with the people who must minister here on a weekly basis. Huh? And not to, to, to overlook my, my brother over there, Brother Joe's, Brother Joe Lyles. <laughs> you know, with the COVID and everything, and because of the fact that he has challenges with, with his respiratory system, he hasn't been around as much lately. But this is a man who came in here every Wednesday during our prayer meeting. And he would play, and we would be just in the spirit worshiping the Lord every single Wednesday. Oh, God, we got good people in here. And I, I hate to start enumerating and picking out people like that because then many people get angry. Sister Glenda, she was one of those also who would be here every single Wednesday. And you dare not end that meeting without her going over that list and call every single, <laughs> every single name on that list and make sure that the people are prayed for. Huh? Sister Allison, right over there, she ain't saying nothing. But they are the ones who's pulling together the school so that the building could be effectively used and we have no wasted space staring us in our face and they're going to find ways of not only making the school work but helping us to reach the community and putting a few pennies in our pockets too. hallelujah God knows people whose hearts is knit and tied to this congregation thank you Jesus yeah. it's the things that we could all be all sister Rose oh God forget her I'm not going to say much. <laughs> Listen, every single one of us, we can be proud of what we have here and what you have built long before I became pastor here. You have been working here, holding it together, and this church has been a beacon in this, in this community. They look to us. They call us for virtually everything. All of the politicians, they call us. They call on me repeatedly and ask for help. Because they know that this is a place that they can find it. And it's not because of me. Sometimes I think it's in spite of me. But it's because of you. You guys make a pastor's heart proud. And I think, yes, hallelujah. <laughs> yes, yes. And I think you could also be proud. Now, Sage, oh God. You better train some people, man, because I don't know. We got to get a few more people to know what he does because the guy is magical. Thank you, son. You're a chip off the old block. <laughs> I don't think he might agree, but... <laughs> Praise the Lord. So, Tani, come join me. Let's talk. Let's talk a little bit. I switch, make this switch up so that we can start talking. How about our recent trip to the Gambia and some of the things that we experienced there? It was a wonderful trip. Praise the Lord. So the Gambia is called the Smiling Coast of Africa. And we discover why when we got there. I've never seen people more loving than in spite of the adversities that they face on a daily basis. These are some really loving people. They all smile and they all welcome you. The minute you walk off that plane 
and you, 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 you go down and you know you don't have all the fancy stuff that attaches to the plane, so you gotta walk down, walk across the tarmac until you get to the bus that will take you to the, um, the, the, the terminal, or the hangar, or whatever they call it, you know? And everybody smiles with you and they say, welcome my brother. We are so glad you're here. Thank you for coming. Thank you for coming. We love to have you. And you know, you just start feeling that welcome feeling right through. They do everything to try to make you feel as comfortable as possible, even when they're going through all of your paperwork. They're very meticulous, but they go through it and with a grim face. And as soon as they finish, they smile and they hand you the paper and say, welcome to the Gambia. We're so glad to have you. One of the key things that they keep saying to us is, welcome home, my brother, my sister. Welcome home. And that, that, that strikes you. As a person of color, it really strikes you. Because in the Gambia, as, as in many other African countries, they are beginning to come to a realization that the black folks that are in the West are here and are as much a part of them as anybody else that live on the continent. And as a result, some of these nations, they have what is called an open repatriation policy, meaning that black people in the West who were taken away from the continent by force, don't sit down, come be. <laughs> who were taken away from the continent by force, that they have a right to return that if you would like to come back to Africa and to live there, you should have that right. And as a result, they maintain that repatriation policy that you would be able to get automatic citizenship when you get there. In the Gambia, that has been reversed because of some of the political problems that they have over the last uh, 10 years or so. But Right now, there's also a move ahead to put back that repatriation policy in place. So that's one of the reasons why um, some of the people, they would say to you, welcome home, my brother. We are glad to have you back. <laughs> when I got there, I, I was so moved because I thought about the fact that my ancestors were taken from the continent by force. And now... I am back, and I probably is one of the first generations who were able to voluntarily go back to the continent. I got there and I felt so moved, I had to kiss the ground, just because of the fact that I know that my ancestors wished that they could have done that, that they could have gone back. But unfortunately, they couldn't. And I, who have the freedom to be able to do so, I thought that I owed it to my ancestors to return to that continent and at least to be there and to see and to understand the people, what's happening, what they're doing, you know, the way they live, the things that they do. And when you get there, you see so many things that you see in the Caribbean and here in the United States that you wonder if we are really left. You really begin to wonder. You hear them saying words that is used commonly anyway in Jamaica, in Trinidad, even in some parts of the South, here among like the Geechee people and so on, South Carolina. You would be amazed of the similarities that exist in spite of the slave trade. Praise the Lord. So, Sage, you want to put up some more of the video? Let's look at some of those images and talk about them. Right, so these are the people with all of the smiles. Everywhere you go, smiles, and people treat you. The thing is that the people are very poor, so um, behind the smile, you have to be very careful because they would take you for a dollar in a heartbeat. They know how to get money out of you. What we found out is that they have two pricing. In fact, there's no fixed price on anything. You come and they see you look like a foreigner, suddenly you got their first price. That's it, first price. 
<laughs> you get the first price. Because everything is negotiable. Now, if you don't know about the first price and the last price, you're going to pay the first price. Which is sometimes 400 times, 400% what they will actually... <laughs> And they have a word that they call us tubabs. Foreigners. Foreigners. You know? So you have the tubab price and then you have the Senegalese price. So if you're smart, it's a good idea to get a Senegalese person with you to negotiate anything that you want to buy. Uh, so, oh God, sorry. The Gambian to, look, <laughs> to, to negotiate anything that you want to buy. Because you would get it so much cheaper if you have a Gambian with you. All right, so just in case you decide to go there, be warned. Praise the Lord. Now, the country is one of the weirdest things. If you look on the screen, you would see the shape of the country. It is the smallest country in, on the African continent. On the contiguous African continent, it's the smallest country on the continent, right? And it is a shape like a snake. You see that light-colored area there? That is the Gambia. And that is because of the history of that country. You will notice around it is it's completely surrounded, except for the ocean, it's completely surrounded by Senegal. They have no neighbors except <laughs> Senegal. And it's because of the history of the country, as I just said. Right? The country was colonized by Europeans, of course. Uh, most of the European powers, the Portuguese were the first that got there, and they initiated slavery and, and, and capturing Africans to bring them to the West to make them slaves. And then what happened is that um, later the French came and some of the other um, um, European nations came. The last that got there were the British, and they were the worst because they were more brutal in slavery than all of the um, predecessor European powers that existed there. Uh, just before the British got there, the French took hold of, of Senegal. And because of all the wars that took place between Britain and France, Britain carved its way into Senegal along, in, along the Gambi, the River Gambi, right? And this is what caused the country to take the shape that it had. They made treaties with some of the local chieftains that were there. And then they fought back the French so that they could get access to the rivers because the rivers took them inland into the continent so that they could be able to do their trade and to capture Africans way deep down into, into the, the, um, the, the continent so that they will be able to carry out the slave trade. So the country is a little thing that is carved out right around both sides of the River Gambi, hence the name, the Gambia, right? And um, Kambi is one of the words for one of the native language, which means a long river, right? So eventually, uh, the perversion of the word by, by the, the Europeans, it ended up being Gambia instead of Kambi, and then later on, everybody referred to it as the Gambia the Gambia, which is now the official name of the country. So this is the way that the country is shaped because of its history. And as a result of, of the fact that this country was under such control by, by the European powers, a lot has happened there. The country has had a painful, painful history. The people were always subjugated and, and, and suppressed because it was essential to keep strong a strong military presence and a strong hand there in order for the Europeans to be able to carry out the trade that they wanted to carry out deep into the, uh, the African continent. Before they carved it out, this pretty much is what it looked like. Senegal was pretty much looking like that and like 18 something this was the way it looked until they finally carved out that little sliver around the river which is called the, the Gambia. Gambia is a beautiful place. Come on Danny, you could help me talk about this now. It's a beautiful country. When you look at the natural flora and fauna of the country, oh my God, I tell you, you would sit there on, on the beaches and you just feel like a peace that passes understanding. <laughs> you know? 
Um, the waters are beautiful. And because of the fact that it's at the mouth of a river, you have a mixture of salt water and sweet water, which they call brackish water. As a result, you have one of the highest diversity of aquatic life that you could find. As a matter of fact, there's so much variety of fish and other living creatures in the, the waters there, not only in the river, but right out into the ocean, you will find every imaginable species of fish. It is so rich with fish that uh, the Chinese um, trawlers, they go through there and they will hook one trawler onto the other and they would just drag a net right up the coast and just haul it in with thousands of pounds of fishes. And then they will go through it, and the ones that they don't want, they just straight back in the water, dead as ever. It washes up on the shore, and it brings an awful smell. They then take the fish that they catch, and they take it into their factories, which they have set up on the coast. And they convert it into dry pellets of food, which is shipped back to China, and it's made into all of the products, you know, cat food, dog food, etc., that we buy here in the United States and other parts of the world. And guess how much of that goes back in terms of wealth into the Gambia? Except for the very little wage that they pay to the people who work there. Nothing else goes back into the Gambia. It is one of the poorest nations on the African continent. The average salary of a Gambian in US dollars per month, can anybody take a guess? Come on, don't sit there and look at me like I'm lying. <laughs> take a guess. How much? Say again. Okay, Sister Glenda says $100. Oh, man, the Gambians will love you. It will work for you any day. The average salary of a, of a Gambian is $50 to $60 a month. $50 to $60 US dollars a month. And when you get that salary, you are highly paid. You're one of the middle class. Brother Phil, man, you'll be a king over there. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Next slide, Sage. The country is beautiful. It shows a diversity between the wealthy and the poor, and it's drastic. When you look around, I mean, as a person who's a tourist like you and me, if we go there, we are treated well. And we could go into all of the fancy places and everybody, you walk the street and everybody's trying to literally pull you off the street into their restaurant, into their store, into their, st whatever. You know, they have people standing on the side of the street trying to get you to come in, right? But of course, the drastic uh, difference between wealth and poverty is seen, you know, and is very, very blatant. Next slide. Of course, this is the beautiful oceans that they have. Stay with me, Seiji. Beautiful oceans. These are some of the hotels and stuff like that that is on the oceans. Luckily, one of the things that the government had done is that they had stopped foreigners from being able to buy up all of the waterfront properties, which I think was a good thing because if you go to Jamaica, you gotta literally pay to go on the beach. Yeah. And we literally paid when we went to Jamaica. We went to pay to go on the beaches because all of these big international corporations buy up the beautiful oceans, build beautiful hotels, and then it's only available to the people who are staying in the hotels. And the people who live in the country can go on the beaches. But the government of Gambia, what they did is they have a 1.5 kilometer zone, which is called the TDA, the Tourist Development Zone. And in order for you to have anything there, you must do it in collaboration with the government. So as a result, what the government do is that it forces foreign corporations to have Gambian partners in order to be able to do things on the TDA. So if you're thinking about investing in Gambia, you better get a Gambian partner as quickly as possible, right? In that way, the government is forcing 
you to partner with the people who live there in order to be able to transfer the wealth and not just take wealth out of the country based on using the beauty of the country. Yes, so here it is, the people. Very, very cultural. Beautiful people, always smiling. You walk down the street, you, you wonder that people who face such abject poverty, why they smile so much? And I mean, I'm a smiler, but I thought I could have smiled, and now I see where my smile come from, why I laugh at everything. People insult me and I smile, you know? And the same thing is, is there when you look at the people of the Gambia. You know, they're walking the street and stuff like that. Sometimes you see the frustration on their face, but all you got to do is look at them long enough and they smile with you, you know? But what you see, as I said before, is the abject poverty that exists in the villages. This is the way that the people live. When you get off what they call the tar roads, the, wood, the roads, very few roads are paved with asphalt as we know it. The vast majority of, 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 those, uh, of the roads that is used by the people are dirt roads. So as a result, there's always dust all over the trees and everything all around the country. On the buildings, you park your car. So if you want to take your fancy Mercedes down there, it's always covered with dust because it's mo mostly dirt roads, right? And when you get off the dirt roads and you drive into the villages, these are the huts and stuff like that that you would see. Now, this is the difference between the villages and the other place where the two babs live. People like us, the so-called two babs. Um, a lot of, of foreigners come in and they buy up all the beautiful houses, all of the beautiful land, the, the, the beautiful places that are close to the beaches as, as close to the beaches as they can get and these houses cost like about anywhere from about $45,000 going up US what does that mean it means that if your salary is $60 a month how many of those houses can you afford to, to buy and to live in yeah so you're forced to live in the house to my left as compared to the expatriates coming from abroad who could buy the beautiful houses and live in them. The difference between wealth and poverty. See the fancy lady there riding on the boat, going down to the hotel that is on the water, as opposed to the man sitting at the bottom. And this is his daily life. God barely makes a living, usually by fishing or by planting peanuts. Peanuts and cashew nuts. Cashews are all over the country. It grows wild. So as a result, they pick the nuts off the cashew and they leave the, the fruit so that the fruit could ripe and people could eat it. But the nuts, that's gone early because they need to sell that in order to live. Peanut is the, is the biggest crop that they have in that country. Um, it's the only natural resource that they really possess. They have very little to trade with. So as a result... Um, being in a peanut business is probably the best business that you could be in, but it's regulated by the government because the only market you have is to sell it to the government. The government then sells it abroad to GIF and some of those other big companies, what's that other one, planters and smuckers and those guys, and they take the peanut. They make peanut butter and all of the byproducts, peanut oil and all of that stuff, and they sell it back to the Gambians and to the rest of us. Because the Gambians don't have a lot of technology, a lot of factories, a lot of ability to be able to convert their own products into the byproducts that consumers like you and I use on a daily basis. Now that, does that give you the impression that maybe you might want to do some investments there? Some of you who have the skills and, and the, the ability and the know-how, and this is one of the things that they say, they're asking, come back home. Come back. But when you come back, don't come here to think you're going to get a job. Because if you don't want to work for $60 a month, you're going to starve. But they say, come back. But when you come, bring technology. Bring education. Bring businesses. Bring things that's going to generate employment to help us to be able to build this country. Because what's happening, folks, is that 
What happened to them 400 years plus ago with slavery is still happening in the same way. The exploitation of the economy by foreigners. Today, the European powers are not so much in there anymore, but now it's taken over by the Chinese, the Lebanese, the Indians, and they're the wealthy people who are coming in now. Some of the Europeans are still there, but they're the wealthy people that's coming in now and buying up everything. And the average Gambian have to work for them, for peanuts, as we, could, as we say. Next slide. So the difference between wealth and poverty. You can live in communities there that look like the one to my right, and then if you're native, you live in the community to my left. Yet still the people are rich in culture. They dance and they sing, and all of the dances that they do and the, the, the things that they wear and stuff like that, it has cultural expressions and meaning. Just like the things that we do in church, when we take a, a piece of bread and we break it and we take a cup and we drink it, there's significance behind that. When you get in to understand why a guy would dress like the guy at the bottom right-hand corner, when you get there, you would ask yourself, you know, well, why does he have to put on all that stuff just to do a dance? But everything that they wear have a significance. When you get to understand it, you would see it coming out of the historical traditions of the people. And it's going to blow your mind as to exactly some of the deep meanings coming out of the experiences and the pathos, the suffering of the people. So when they do the dances... And the way all of the gab and stuff like that, it all carries deep meaning. The children, oh my God, the children, they are amazing. You know, they come around you and they all want to touch you. They want to grab your hand. When you look at their little eyes, oh God. Go ahead. So I While I cry. <laughs> so Pastor has become so emotional and he cries. Well, he wasn't always a wuss, right? But he's become one because um, what happens is that your heart breaks for all the things that you see. So why I wanted to kind of inject right here where the children are concerned, I remembered um, meeting with one of the local guys who manages a restaurant close to where we stayed. And um, he was just so happy at the opportunity to have met us and just in talking to him and him sharing with us just a little bit about his life and, you know, Pastor having a heart for children, we have our children and, you know, all of our kids, we wanted to meet his family. And so we said that to him. And for days we had been trying to get there. And his son kept asking him like, daddy, are they coming? Are they, are they coming? You know, because he just, they, he couldn't believe really that we were going to come because it's like, well, so his, so his father said to us, guys, you got to tell us now when you're going to come because we're trying to make preparations for you guys. But my son is not believing me. My son is starting to think I'm lying because it's like, are you guys going to come? You know, and I'm just thinking what difference, you know, our presence would make just a, a little bit of like hope or a little bit of joy. And so we finally made the time and we went and met his family. And when we got there, he only has about three or four boys. And it had about 30 kids all around us, and they're all from the same town. They're all, actually, they're all from the same house, from the same yard, right? The same, compound. the same compound, they call it, right. So 30 of them come out, and like they're all around us. And, of course, we're taking pictures, because the pictures you see on probably are, maybe were some of those, and his kids are there. And to him, that just meant so much. It was just such an experience just to have Pastor and I visit, because it was like, not only was he able to show his son that, like, they did come, see? Like, you know, they, they didn't just tell us that they were going to come and they didn't come. They did come. Now, mind you, getting to their, their house and their town, I was going to throw up because my stomach was like this because this is the road going up and down to where they are. And the cars is a mess because good luck to you if you don't have a 4 by 4 getting there. But the point is, when we got there, the hope and the joy that you saw. Now, I was wondering, too, why they were so excited to see us. And now we know when you go, we have to bring toys. They wanted toys. They wanted balls. They were like, no soccer ball, no, no toys. And I'm like, oh, my God, if only I had known that that's all you wanted. But I just wanted to share that because it breaks your heart just watching them. And you're thinking to yourself, they're so poor and have hardly anything and all they want is a toy. Praise the Lord. And one of the things that they would do is the kids, as soon as they get a little chance with you, they touch you and say, hello. They know two words in English. Hello. 
And they say, hello. They say, something. <laughs> Those are the only two words there. Praise the Lord. Hello, something, you know, anything. Give me something, you know. And it will break your heart. Because when we went to a place called Jufore, and that's just the place. Sorry, folks. That's the place that you, you leave off to go to Kunta Kinte Island. Kunta Kinte Island is the island that um, roots, the book Roots and the movie that was made back in the 70s. It's a true story. Most people didn't know that. I didn't even know it was a true story. I thought it was a fictitious rendition of what might have happened. But it's an actually true story. They actually found all of the records, including the records of the Akalos back in Africa that spoke about the disappearance of Kunta Kinte. And Alex Haley was able to trace his ancestral story. When we got there, there um, just before we went off to the island, we meet all these little kids again with the same thing, hello, something. And when you go from one place to the other, they would run after the cars because they hope to catch you if they didn't get something here, they're gonna get something over the next place, you know? And we were so sad that we didn't bring much except the money that was in our pocket, but you can give kids money like that, you know? But they will take it. <laughs> but Tani just had a pack of chewing gums. She, I don't know why she had so many chewing gums with her. And she started taking them and handing the kids one each, and they were so glad to get the chewing gum. They were pulling it apart, and then she began to run out. So she started tearing the chewing gums in two and giving. <laughs> the last girl didn't get any chewing gum. So she came back and said, he wouldn't give her a piece of his chewing gum. So we had to insist that the guy gave it. So it just shows you. It just shows you, and it will break your heart will break your heart to see the kids running after the car just to get something, anything. You know, and the minute you're there, they all pull out whatever they could do. There were some little boys who had a little instrument that they made with a string, a piece of wood, and it was attached to something else. And they will play that thing, and it is such sweet music. These two little boys, and all the other kids would wrap around them, and they're looking at you because they know after they, these guys finish playing, you're going to give them some kind of reward. So they're all waiting for when the reward starts getting distributed. You know, so they would just play, and, and you know, you're there. And I tell you, the people, they're all looking for you to give them something. So a tip goes a long way. Good, and one U.S. dollar is like 50 to 52 um, delassies. So giving a tip is easy. You wouldn't give a U.S. dollar. What you do, you give delassies. But they're so thankful for it because to get a delassie to them is a hard thing. They work hard for delassies. You see? So you might be able to give a guy 200 delassies, and that's like giving... $4. And to him, that's more than he probably works for for the day. You know? So we went off to the island, and on that island, it will break your heart when you see what the, the British had done and, and some of the things that they, they had engaged in. And, and the British and all of the other powers that, that were in there and how they exploited the people. And when you hear the story, it's heart-rending. You get angry on that island, you, you get sad, you, you experience all the human emotions that you possibly could experience. And then you come back over and you meet with the children again, and they take you over to the museum. And in the museum, there were a lot of artifacts. Good? If you would skip, say this one. Um, go back a little bit. Right, so this was the children. All right, next one. No, go forward. Yeah. So this, this one just talks about the, the problems that they have with water. You, would, you cannot imagine that a country that is built around a river and the people do not have pipe one water. So the children will go and travel three miles in the morning to fill up one of those containers 
and bring it back home with water that lasts for the day. As a result of making that journey, by the time they get home, they can't go to school. It's too late. You see, but they must bring water every day into the household or they would have no water. And the children had to make that journey on a daily basis, right? Thank God for some organizations that have been doing some things that they have what is called now the borehole projects. And what they would do is they have this machine that would go around and drill wells in the ground and put a pump in there. And as a result, they would put up stands and, and, and these 800-gallon um, um, tanks in various locations, the pump will fill these up. And as a result, the people don't have to go to the three-mile journey. They just go to a standpipe, and it's usually within 100 feet or so of their house, and they could fill up the waters, right? And one of those boreholes costs probably like about 500, 600 US dollars, right? So the, organi the organization that I got in contact with that are doing these boreholes as many as they possibly can and as fast as they can raise money all over. Now, the, it's a pretty long sliver of a country. And if you don't live close to the river, you have water problems. So they're trying to build as much of these boreholes as possible so that they could be able to alleviate some of the, the frustrations that these people have with, uh, with um, their water problems. Next stage. The country is dominated by the religion of Islam. Islam is all over. And you know, the people have a high sensitivity because poor people in particular, they always turn to God. And in turning to God, they turn to the only option that is available to them. Islam is there. In the 12th centuries, the Arabs came down and you know how they propagate Islam. Of course, they propagate Islam by the sword. So now it's entrenched in the culture of the people. Most of the people don't understand the tenets of Islam. They don't really know all of the teachings. They just know that one of the things they're supposed to do is to fast for 30 days every year in the month of Ramadan. Right? While we were there, it was the month of Ramadan, and everybody's fasting. So we begin to ask the, some of the people, well, why are you fasting for Ramadan? And what was the answer the one guy gave you? One of them, I know this doesn't work. The guy said, um, he's so funny. He goes, I'm not really religious. I'm just trying to lose weight. <laughs> but then he was not, he's a guy that came from um, England and then went to, he's a guy that came from England and then just um, had gone back. He had studied abroad and had gone back home. He is Gambian. So I asked him, I said, Mohammedin, why, you know, what are you, fa he was like, really, I'm not religious. I'm just trying to lose weight. I'm fat. And not just, yes, yes, well, well, all the other people, why are they fasting? And what did he say? They are really just praying five times a day and trying to pray their way out of hell. They're just trying to get out of hell. They don't They're want trying to, to make sure they don't go to hell. <laughs> That's what it is. So it tells you that the religion, while these people are very devout um, Islamics, you know, the religion is still yet superficial. Like most Christians in America, they are Christians by default. Same as in the Gambia, people are Islamic by default. And um, the fact is that the Christian church has not made a very strong headway into that nation. Uh, the population is still something like almost 95% Islamic. Right. When we were there, we went to, guess what? A Methodist church. And <laughs> Trinity Methodist church. And it was a good experience. The worship was really nice. I enjoyed myself. I was dancing in the congregation. I was like, you know, because the African rhythm and, and all of that stuff. It was really, really a nice worship service. And I wonder why they don't do more evangelism to be able to reach out to the people because the government is not an Islamic government. It's a secular government as opposed to Saudi Arabia, one of those other, Iran, where you cannot proselytize. That, relig that nation is open, meaning that you could have a crusade and you could convert people. You see what I'm saying? But yet still, Christians has only been able to come up to the tune of about 4% of that nation. So it tells you that maybe mission work there might be able to make some good headways, and we might be able to bear the cross of Christ into a nation like that, and to make a difference to the people to bring them to know who Jesus is. Amen. Praise the name of the Lord. Yes, so this is the island called Kunta Kinte Island, and what you're looking at, at there is a picture I took from just as you approach the island on a boat. And those trees that you're seeing, those are called the baobab tree. 
baobab. It's a beautiful tree. It's like most of the, the year it doesn't have any leaves on it. But it's alive. It looks like it's all dried up, right? But it's alive. It's a beautiful tree. The base of it sometimes is as huge as about 15 feet wide. And um, the, the ones on that island is about a thousand years old. And our guy that took us there, he says, if these trees could talk, they will tell you some stories. And I tell you, it's a really amazing. The baobao bears a fruit, and the fruit make a drink that they call the baobao drink. And it's, oh my God, it's sort of like sour sap, for those of you who knows what that is. It's made with milk and stuff, and it's very, very tasty. You know, This was the fort that the British built on that island, and this is where they kept the slaves they kept the Africans before they sent them to the West to make them slaves. Praise God. What happened to that island is that it blew up. I think sometimes God have a sense of humor. Um, where they store all of their artillery and all of the gunpowder and stuff like that. Something went wrong and that whole thing blew up. And the island was never rebuilt because very soon after that, um, they abolished slavery in, I believe, 18-something, 18, 18 early 1800s. This is what you see when you go to the museum that is just off the island in the village of Dufore. And they have a, a tribute to the Africans because there was also slavery there. Some of the Africans that were there were also kept, um, captured and kept in slavery. Um, so what they showed is entire families that were taken, husbands, wives, and children, one of the things that they would do when they take a woman on the island, they would strip her of all of her beads and all of the things that she's wearing, beads around her waist, around her necks, around her hands, right? And they would strip them naked. And they usually would impregnate the women because a female slave is, that is pregnant is more valuable. So by the time she come to the West, she would be pregnant in a delicate state and they would be able to fetch a higher price because the person buying her is actually getting two for the price of one, right? Of course, you know, whole families were taken, and the, some of the artifacts you're seeing there is how they held them with, you know, the chains on their hands, the shackles that they would put on them. And for the ones that was most troublesome, you see that thing with the circle and the four spikes pressing out? They would put that circle around your neck, right, with that long thing sticking out, so that for you it become... Um, on, um, what's the word I'm looking at? Unmaneuverable. You can hardly move, so you can't give trouble. See? So that's what they would do. But the statue on the far, on my far left, which is, is your right, um, that statue is one that was erected um, when the country became independent. And what they did is that they put up that statue. If you get a close up of that statue, you would see at the bottom, the word says, never again. Never again. Right? You know, this is a guy with his hands like this, with chains hanging off, and the chains are broken. Never again. You know? And it's the commitment of, of that country saying that that will never happen to their people again. Unfortunately, they don't realize it's happening. It continues through the economy of the country. The people are being exploited. And they, there's so little that they could do about it. Next slide. Now, this is on, on the island, Kunta Kinte Island, the guide, and some of the people that were there with us. The guide is the, the guy in the white shirt. And of course, the lady in red there is Tani. Right is the lady in red here, um, who's having a real moment after hearing some of the stories on that island. Incidentally, I was telling you about the beads that the women would wear. The minute that they get to the island and they step off the boat on the shore, they will cut away all of their clothes and all of the beads. Now you can actually walk on the shore of the island and you can find beads that's been sitting there for hundreds of years. We brought some of them with us because you can actually see how they made the holes in the, in the little rocks and the little pebbles and stuff like that. And made them into the beads that went around the waist and, and that adorned the women, you know. And those things are still there that you can literally pick up as artifacts that you can keep, you know. But when you have that experience and you walk over that island and you see some of the things that were described to us, it really brings you to a place where you have to take a moment 
to breathe and to swallow. And to... I think everybody should go. Next slide. Praise the Lord. So this is what happened when they um, finally got free and, and they declared that, that things are never going to happen again. That happened there. They put up, they took down the British flag. Good. That stood for British power and dominance. And they put up that green, black, and red flag. And that represents freedom. Good. And the liberation of the African continent. And all that they aspire to in terms of their freedom and their ability to be able to, to live in freedom and prosperity. Right? So that flag flies there every day. And that statue sits right there in the village called Dufode. Right? And it stands and represents all that their hopes and their dreams could afford them. Praise the Lord. So let's, let's stop here. As you look at this cute little thing, look at these children. Most of them cannot go to school. The education is poor. They don't know the history of their own country. Every time I look at the picture of that little girl, with the beads in her hair, and look at those eyes. It represents the hope of Africa. It represents the potential. of all that these kids could be. Don't even have the ability to go to school and get the basic education that they need. Yet still, sometimes I came back here and I was a little bit upset with my kids. I pissed off about all kind of little stupid things. Uh, the internet isn't working well. This game is outdated. Folks, we are Christians. And this day is called the day of Pentecost. If it's anything about the gospel of Jesus Christ, it's that it brings grace lift. When you propagate the gospel, the Holy Spirit is there. And where the Spirit of God is, there is one liberty and there is prosperity. The best thing that we could share with the people in Africa is to come to know Jesus. And all that comes from having a relationship with the God that we serve. Jesus says, go into all the world. Preach this gospel to every nation, every man, every woman, every boy, every girl. Preach this because this is able to make a difference. Grace lift. When you have a relationship with God, oh, you may not have a ton of wealth, but you have the presence of God with you. The blessings of God make it rich, the Bible says, and it adds no sorrow. Believers, this is the end of my speech today. This is some of the experiences that we have had. I am committed in my heart that I can do as best as I can for the people that I met over there and work with organizations there that are trying to make a difference and all of the wealth that we have here in the West and all that we enjoy and all that we, 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 we frown and fuss about, going to that place would make you think. It gives you pause to know that you have so much. I take my family out and we eat and you get a bill of $200. One person in Gambia getting that money, that makes, he could literally change his entire life. And we would spend $50 at McDonald's like that and not even bat an eye. Oh God. May God bless you in Jesus' name. <laughs>
take a listen to this beautiful song, folks. The higher you build your barriers, the taller I become. The farther you take my rights away, the faster I will run. deny me you can decide to turn your face away no matter cause there's something inside so strong I know that I can make it though you're doing me wrong so wrong you thought that my pride was gone oh no Something inside so strong oh, Something inside so strong The more you refuse to hear my voice The louder I will sing You hide behind walls of Jericho will come tumbling Deny my place and time You squander wealth That's mine My light will shine So brightly It will blind you Cause there's Something inside So strong So strong I know that I can make it Doing me wrong, so wrong. You thought that my pride was gone. Oh no, <laughs> something inside so strong. Oh, something inside so strong. Brothers and sisters, when they insist, we're just not good enough.
inside so strong. Whenever we do it to the least of these, we do it unto thee. So come and help us. If that's what you've heard from us, come. Come and help us. Because when I'm about to pray into these, I can't keep my heart so heavy. You know, for the people in the suffering, Welcome home, my brother. Come and help us. It struck me that in the book of Acts, I think it's 19 or 15, I can't remember. It's the same word that was said to the Apostle Paul in Macedonia. When he got that vision, come and help us. And God forbid him from preaching in Asia, but directed him to go to Macedonia. Praise the name of the Lord. One of the things that happened while we were there is that I attended a meeting with a chieftain in a village called Nemakunku. And in that, we sat around, they have, they sit in a circle. And I was really scared because nobody is social distancing or anything over there, you know. And you sit in a circle and someone is right up on you and it's like, oh. My God, thank God I got vaccinated, you know. But um, that's just the way that they, they convene. And what happened is that they were discussing some of the problems they were having. And they were about to, there's a hum on the mic. They were about to go, they're about to go into the rainy season, which begins in the month of June. And what have happened for the last 30 years is that because of some of the developments that was built lower down, the rivers and the waters no longer have the ability to flow through the normal water courses to go to the ocean. And that's, that's because of the lack of physical planning because people come and they just buy up a piece of land and they don't care about what's going on in other parts of the, the country. They just build a development and sell it to all of the rich people. So the water now backs up into the village. It covers the, the streets, it backs up into the people's houses and most of the houses are mud huts. So when, when water comes in, it's only a matter of time before it becomes waterlogged and it falls apart. You know, the houses fall on people while they're sleeping. And even worse, because of the fact that the streets are flooded, the people can't go to work because sometimes there could be as much as five feet of water on the street. Now note something, most people there work and they get paid daily. And the money they get today is what they use to feed their kids tomorrow. Some of the women will put these big baskets on their heads with fruits and whatever they have to sell. And they will walk for miles with that on their head. And they would sell that. And that's how they're going to feed the kids the next day. So when, when it rains and there's a flood and they can't go out, it's only a matter of days before there's complete starvation in a village. So what happened is that there was one woman who decided she couldn't take it anymore. She put the thing on her head and she was walking through a couple of inches of water. And what happened? encounter a snake and that snake bit her and she died. Another woman who was in the process of childbirth started having complications. They couldn't get a car in to take her to the hospital that's a few miles away and they couldn't get a car in or out. She ended up dead because of the complications. So those are the problems. Simple problems with simple fixes that the people have to live with every day. So what we decided to do is that we, we thought that maybe we could help them because they need to raise about 100 feet of road a couple of inches so that the water would be able to back up on the street and they would have access in and out. And I asked them, well, how much does a project like this cost? And they said, 97,000 Delasi. And I just gave you the exchange rate, right? That's like $2,000 US. It's like any one of you sitting in the pews there could give me that today. Amen. <laughs> Nobody answered. <laughs> Praise the Lord. But I'm, I'm letting you go now. I'm just saying, and I'm just saying this because I'm showing you simple, simple problems. I will take easy fixes, and we could make such a big difference for some of these people. So I'd like to ask you, sir, ma'am, 
if you could, if you could extend a hand in any little thing that you have, that we could send it to these people. We would like to send out this donation to them this week. There's an organization they call the Council of African Descendants, and what they do is that they're the ones who's doing the ball holes and stuff like that, and they would just take this money, and they have already started trying to build a road. So if we could send this money to them, they'll be able to truck in gravel and stuff that they need to elevate the roads. Amen? So if you can, please, give us whatever you could. Any little bit would help. Amen? If you don't have it, don't give it. But if you can, please, we're asking that you help us. You could do it online. We have set up a special fund for just to help Gambia as much as possible. And if you have it today, you can put it in the... Um, in the offering box. Just remember, clearly demarcate it so that we would know that this is what you intend to give to what is called the Gambia Project. Amen? Just write on your, your check or on your envelope, the Gambia Project. Amen? May God bless you and keep you. May he cause his face to shine upon you and give you peace. Hallelujah. God bless you, believers. Thanks for coming today. And join us next week when we are going to have another wonderful time in the presence of the Lord. Our speaker is going to be guess who? Anybody who laughed first is going to be the speaker. <laughs> who was the one who laughed, laughed first? Anybody? Who, who laughed first in the house here? Uh-oh. -uh. Guess who's our speaker next week? No, Sister Rose, praise the name of the Lord. Come on, put your hands together. So we're looking forward to this message that she's going to bring to us from her heart and from the Lord. And we just want to come out next week, believers. Come into the house of God. Those of you that are at home, it's okay for you to come back. Come into the house of God. Let us join together and let us worship the Lord. If you're uncomfortable, it's okay to stay home. But for those of you who can, join us in God's house and let's worship the Lord in the beauty of the holiness. Praise the name of the Lord. The taller I become The farther you take my rights away The faster I will run You can deny me You can decide To turn your face away No matter, cause there's something inside so strong I know that I can make it Though you're doing me wrong, so wrong You thought that my pride was gone Oh no Something inside so strong
Something inside so strong 